Why did you take the decision to pile the bodies on top of each other in a freezer? What do you mean? Why did you do that? Well, I only had one deep freezer. I mean, take the decision to pile the bodies on top of each other. Where was she gonna go? But how did you conceivably sleep at night? I slept well. Of course, at first I cried. It was f***ed up because I had to let go of all of that. I'm doing my best, Michelle, to listen to what you're saying. However, I, I need to know that you also accept that you had a number of other options open to you other than the extreme violence with which you decided to act. What do you mean, accept it? You had a number of other options. There were no other options. I, I'm not playing crazy. I wasn't in depression. None of that. It's no excuse for rape. Hello, everybody, and welcome to True Crime Banter, the podcast aimed to bring in you your dose of murder relaxation. So just sit back and enjoy. to another episode of the True Crime Banter Podcast. Here we are. A cast of little pods, just for you <laughs> and I. Great. <laughs> Today, uh, we are both covering a case yeah. that you did a substantial amount of. Yes, we're both covering one case together. Yes, yeah, yeah. a case together. You did all the research, though. Yeah. I'll be I honest. Mean, I'll whatever. be honest. You know, I, I'm going to tell the <laughs> truth, the whole honest. truth, and nothing we're but the truth. We're all friends here, right? Uh, yeah, something like that. Something. So yeah. Um, hello, welcome everybody. Hope you're you're ready for this case today. We're going to be covering the case of. Do you want to mention her name? Obviously, it's in the title. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, Michelle Blair. Okay. Like Michelle with the T. Oh well, there Michelle we go. Blair. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah. We're just going to go ahead and get right into it. Yeah. It's March 2015 when a crew from the 26th District Court showed up to the Detroit home of Michelle Blair. The 35-year-old mother of four had fallen months behind in due rent, and with multiple attempts of contact from the apartment and the court, an eviction team was sent over to begin the removal process. For a while now, Michelle had been keeping her and her children afloat by borrowing money from family members. But between the five of them, it didn't help much and ran out quickly. Recently, her family had all decided that they wouldn't be supporting her anymore, telling her that she needed to get a job and go back to school. Refusing to find work, she once again found herself in extreme debt and getting kicked out for the third time. When the crew arrived that day in March, nobody was home, so they proceeded anyways. Load by load, the team members started emptying the home. When the crew approached a deep freezer, oddly kept in the living room, they opened it up. As one would, they expected to find the normal contents of a freezer ready to be emptied out. But instead, what they find is a young girl's body, wrapped in plastic, laid inside. Quickly pulling themselves together, they called the police. Once on scene, police began examining the contents, and when they began removing the girl, they make a second horrible discovery. Another child laid under her. Again, wrapped in plastic, but this time, an even younger boy. At this time, police were already out trying to locate the homeowner, and almost immediately, Someone who knew her came forward saying that Michelle was nearby at another neighbor's apartment. She was found with two of her four kids, aged 8 and 17, but her other two, 9-year-old Stephen Barry and 13-year-old daughter Stoney Blair, were nowhere to be found. When being escorted to a police car, Michelle was quoted simply saying, I'm sorry. While she was on her way to the station, the unidentified children's bodies were being transported to the morgue where they had to thaw for three days 
until a proper examination could be performed. Once completed, it was confirmed. Michelle's other two children, Stephen and Stoney, had been found. To everyone's surprise, the coroner estimated that they had been in that freezer for almost three years. Detectives not only needed to find out both how and why they ended up in the freezer, but also how two children had gone unseen for three years and nobody noticed. This is where a very calm and forthcoming Michelle tells Detective Diaz in her own words what happened. This would later be used as Michelle's defense. She said it started back in 2012. She was at home when her youngest son, Jack, started playing with dolls in a very sexually suggestive manner. Alarmed, she asked him, why are you doing that? Did anybody ever do this to you? He first denied it, but when pressed again, said yes. When asked by who, he said his brother Stephen. Of course, in shock, she took Jack upstairs to confront Stephen about this. Stephen denied it over and over. Michelle, believing there was no reason for Jack to be making this up, left the room and sat on the ground, not sure how to feel or what to think. She couldn't believe her own child would do this to their sibling. This is where she decided Stephen needed to pay for what he had done. This is where we're going to insert a graphic warning for everyone. She came back in the room and started punching eight-year-old Stephen. It isn't until this assault that Stephen admits to harming Jack. She then proceeded to put a bag over his head, making him lose consciousness multiple times. Taking it even further, she forced him under scalding hot water in the shower, even choking him with a belt. The torture continued for about a week, with small breaks in between to let him rest and feed him very small amounts of food. Going to his room one day, Michelle noticed his breathing sounded off and his eyes were fluttering. She said she attempted CPR but admit she didn't know how to do it. She then said she realized it was pointless and that her son had passed. Eight-year-old Stephen had succumbed to his injuries. Not knowing what to do, she said she closed his door, sat on the floor against the wall, processing the situation. After some time, she placed his body in the freezer they kept in the living room downstairs. When asked why she didn't call for medical help, she said she didn't have a choice. She knew she would be taken from her other children. During this entire interview, Michelle doesn't get very emotional. She's clear, calm, and volunteers information. It isn't until she's asked about placing Stephen in the freezer that you see her start to cry. She said she put him in there with his favorite blanket, the blanket he always carried around and was very protective of. According to her surviving daughter, everyone living in the home knew Stephen was in the freezer and was forced to go about their everyday lives walking past like nothing had happened. A daily reminder of what happens if you make mom mad. Fast forward about nine months. Being typical siblings, Michelle heard an argument breaking out in the next room, so she walked in and asked what was going on. Jack was upset. Stoney was sitting next to him, and Michelle asked why Jack was bothered by it. Jack said it was because Stoney was, quote, mean to him. Michelle asked what he meant by that. Jack said she took his food and hurt him when nobody was around. When asked further, Jack said Stoney had touched his butt after taking off his diaper a while back. Alarmed after what she had just, or I'm sorry, alarmed after what had just happened with Stephen months back, Michelle asked Stoney if this was true. Stoney denied this adamantly, but Michelle pushed further, once again thinking there's no reason for Jack to make this up. What she got out of Stoney was a bunch of statements about not liking Jack and how she didn't love him and how he deserved to be picked on. She then got more aggressive with Stoney, wanting more clear-cut answers, so she pushed her against a wall and asked again. Stoney again denies the claims, and Michelle picks up what she described as a blue wooden rod nearby and starts hitting Stoney in the head with it. Again, it isn't until an assault happens that the child confesses to something happening. 
Michelle then starts punching Stoney and repeatedly choking and kicking her. This goes on for a while, and then Stoney is put in her room where she stayed for two days with minimal food and no interaction. Unlike Stephen, Stoney's torture went on for almost two weeks. Two weeks of isolation, being choked, starved, punched, beaten in the head, and neglected. At some point during this two-week period, Michelle learned Stoney had not only been abusing Jack, but also Stephen all these years. Michelle had no idea how to process any of this. She was disgusted and tormented with the thought that all this time, under her own roof, two of her children were getting away with such heinous acts. Overcome with anger, Michelle started punching Stoney, and in the midst of this, Stoney actually hit her back, something she had never done before. Panicked at what she had just done, Stoney said it was a reflex, and Michelle says this is when she decided to smother Stoney. After it was over, Stoney was placed on top of Stephen in the freezer, and that is where they both laid for nearly three years until that day in March of 2015. Now at this point, we have no idea if what Michelle is saying is true, but during the interview, she came off very truthful, even if it was her version of the truth. Right. There weren't long pauses where you could tell she was trying to think of stuff to say. She explained things multiple times when asked with no issues at all. She was never aggressive with the interviewer. She was just like calmly telling a story, even if it was a super fucked up story. She admits multiple times that what she did was wrong, but she was protecting Jack, and she doesn't regret that at all. Many times, she paints herself as Jack's hero, and that she felt she did her duty as a mother, even if that meant harming her other kids in the process. While Michelle might have felt justified in that she had good reason for these actions, the information coming in from others didn't quite match. When examined by a psychologist and a physician, the two surviving children admit there was a long history of abuse in the home. It was normal for them to get beaten on a regular basis, for any number of things perceived as wrong. When examined, they each had marks and scars all over them from being hit over a long period of time. During her interview, Michelle admits that her discipline methods were too much for children and that she has always struggled with how to properly handle her kids. Not only was there physical abuse going on, but when you look at police photos of their apartment after the bodies were found, it's an absolute mess. It's hard to imagine four kids, at one point, were being kept in the home in this condition. With so much regular abuse going on, you may wonder, like I did and many others, how nobody noticed marks on the kids or how nobody noticed that two kids were missing for almost three years. Yeah. The biggest contributing factor was isolation. All the children had been pulled out of school years back. At the time, in the state of Michigan, it was not legally required for parents to prove their children were enrolled in any type of school. At one point, Michelle had met with the principal, lying, and saying that she was moving out of state with her brother and taking the children with. When the state reached out for school enrollment, Michelle let them know she was going to be homeschooling them from now on. Not true. Once again, legally, there was no obligation on either end to confirm how and where the kids were being schooled. Whether Michelle didn't want the burden of pickups and drop-offs or having to help with homework, it's not really stated why the children were pulled out. Possibly a control thing. She can keep an eye on all of them if they were always at home with her. Yeah, not only were the children kept from outsiders, they were also kept from family. Michelle's four children were fathered by different men, and from the reports, uh, it looks like two of them were from one father and then the other two from a separate father. Both fathers were said to be not involved in their children's lives, occasionally popping in and out or giving minimal child support payments randomly throughout the years. One of the fathers was also in prison for a good chunk of the children's lives, making it even easier to not see his kids. When the fathers would inquire about where their kids were, they said that Michelle always had some answer ready. They were either staying with an auntie out of town or with her brother and his children. 
and that's as far as the questions went, uh, you know, apparently. Put this all together, and it's no wonder that Mitchell got away with not only abuse, but a double homicide for years. By the time Mitchell was assessed and deemed fit for trial, her team had put together what they could. During proceedings, it came out that Mitchell had a very rough upbringing herself, and that this may have played the biggest part in the crimes that she had committed. As a child, Michelle said she was sexually abused by multiple strangers due to the fact that her mother was having to work and basically leaving her with whoever was available. She speaks out about the permanent damage this did to her and how she reacted out of fear that Jack would end up just like her if she didn't get rid of the issue, the issue being her two abuser children. The prosecution explained that when Jack was examined after being taken into Child Protective Services, there was no physical signs that he had ever been sexually abused, though that doesn't mean he hadn't been inappropriately touched at some point. This trial was different from the beginning. Here we had a mother who actually confessed to killing two of her children, claiming it was to protect another one of her children. She pled guilty from the beginning, even going as far to say that she didn't regret it because Stephen and Stoney were quote-unquote demons and deserved it. At multiple hearings, when it was her turn to speak, Michelle often showed frustration. She wondered why it was taking so long to get her to prison or get the death penalty, which she actually wanted. She was confused. If she had confessed multiple times and given great deals of the details of the account, why did they have to go through all these hearings and proceed with the trial? It was clear from the beginning that she did it, had no regrets, and just wanted this entire thing to be over with. After Michelle was eventually found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, there was the issue of custody of her two surviving children. They had been put into foster homes while all this mess was going on, and now Michelle was going against the two fathers of the surviving children. During a few of these hearings, Michelle had to be removed for outbursts and aggression. Michelle maintained that she had raised these kids by herself, and the men were never there, but now they wanted to be a part of their lives. The anger eventually got to be too much, and she couldn't be a part of the hearings anymore. In the end, Michelle lost all her parental rights. As for the father of the youngest son, Jack, he lost his parental rights. Jack was then put into the foster system officially, was adopted, and has since reported to be in school and thriving. The father of the oldest surviving daughter was granted parental rights, but she soon turned 18 and was deemed a ward of the state. The judge made this choice so she could have access to programs and state assistance for school, even being given two years of college. The judge wanted to make sure that she got something good out of this whole mess. As for Michelle, she didn't just quietly go off to prison and serve her time for the crimes that she deemed as necessary. There's been reports that she's been involved in multiple physical altercations, even storing up urine and fecal matter in a can and throwing it in a prison Jesus guard's Christ. face on occasion. There was even a time when a fellow prisoner said Michelle admitted to her that she made up the sexual motive about her kids so people would feel bad for her about killing her children. But none of this ever went anywhere or was proven or anything like that. She has since done multiple interviews where she almost always speaks in a constant state of defense and aggression. It's hard to tell whether she knows how insane this all comes off or if she truly sees herself as some type of hero and that people will side with her for being real about such heinous crimes. Many sources state how extremely rare it is for sexual abuse to start that young from a very young sibling to another sibling. It almost always happens because it happened to them first and that's where it's learned if that's the case then who started with stony for then right. stony to teach steven and so on to jack right second how in the world michelle lived in this very small apartment surrounded by her children all day every day and to never see any of the abuse that supposedly was going on for years also, for Jack to point out stuff that happened when he was in diapers, when most kids don't remember anything from happening in their diaper years, was also something that was raised. Yeah. Thirdly, what Detective Diaz tried to point out to Michelle in her interview, 
that Michelle wasn't quite grasping. How did you just take Jack's word for this all? Children say weird and made up stuff all the time. I'm in no way taking away from this, of course, just in case all of this really did happen. Yeah. But it seemed like it was jumped from what did you say happened to beating the crap out yeah, of your kids. Yeah, exactly. There was no yeah. discussion in between, it right. seemed like. Mm-hmm. Even Detective Diaz was like, so did you, before you like started beating the crap out of them, did you like want to take Jack to a physician and see if any of this stuff was real, mm-hmm. if he really had been like sexually assaulted this whole time? And she was like, no, because I know that they did it. Yeah, he said it. Yeah, How would he make it exactly. up? She seems to really hold on to the fact that her kids admitted to it even though she doesn't see the correlation between i was beating them up and then they admitted to something to get her to stop doing it she was like no they said that they did it so yeah i beat them up i mean they said it so i have to do what has to be done versus yeah she never quite understood that when people were pointing it out to her yeah one thing for sure we may never know the truth behind michelle blair's actions or thought process From the beginning, she's always come off very honest, almost too honest. It's always a little sketchy when someone comes out immediately and admits to something terrible and then proceeds as if it was justified. But you almost never hear about a mother doing this towards her own children. With all the videos watched in this research, the comments are actually full of people, surprisingly, who are understanding of Michelle's actions. People who sympathize with the woman who was born into abuse herself, only to repeat the cycle like we often hear. On the surface, that's probably what it looks like. Did she really think she was saving her kids, or did she snap and have to cover her tracks? Whatever it was, we can all be at ease knowing she will never be allowed to be around another child in her lifetime. So I would love to know your thoughts on this. Well. And everyone else. But you <laughs> yeah. first because you're right here. Right. It, I'm interested. I would actually like to know um, the listeners who have listened to this. Um, do you guys believe her story or not? Right. And I mean, do you think she's justified? I've We mentioned on the last podcast, I will put it as a question for this one on Spotify. Because I remember the first time hearing this case, there is a moment when she starts discussing her reasoning for this Mm -hmm. about, uh, well, you know, I found out that they were being abusive towards Jack. Yeah. And thus, I came from that home and I don't want that happening to him. And basically like rage, quote unquote, justified rage. Right. In my head. Mm -hmm. There is a moment where you're like, and like you just mentioned, you're like, oh, like uh, she is doing it out of what she thinks is the good of her heart what she thinks i think it gets lost in the story that she we actually mentioned it she had to be deemed fit for trial right because i think like mentally she probably stable, yes is yeah. unstable yeah and the trauma that she not not to her own faults yeah i mean i i think she faced trauma in her childhood that is uh, definitely affecting the way she approaches all of her life now. Yeah. I, th- in my head, I think that, uh, she is justifying it herself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there, none of this yeah. actually truly went on. She just kind of assumes that yeah. it happens no matter what. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the, like, I feel, um, weird for, I guess leaning maybe too far one way because on the very off chance that this was happening to jack by the way jack is not his real name but he's a minor and his real name is stated in some sources um but then also in some sources it's stated that they don't want to do it out of respect and privacy and so i'm like even though i know the real name you can go look it up if you care but i don't really want to do that but anyway just on the off chance this was actually happening to jack i I don't want to be like, yeah, she made well, it all up or anything yeah. like that. I don't, I don't know. But if there's so many other things in like the con column of this, like pro, she has a protective nature, but then the con is you were letting your kids live in squalor. Yeah. 
the pictures is basically a hoarders without like all of the boxes of stuff. It's like there's like old Coke cans on the counter and pieces of like hair balls and stuff. Like it's just disgusting and terrible. And then on top of that, I mean, she wasn't working. Yeah, so I, if, there's if no that way the kids the were getting what they actually needed. She was getting, I think, what did they say? Like $700 in food assistance a month or something. But between five people, I mean, where's the other money coming from then if that's just food assistance? Yeah, like if, where, where are you getting diapers and stuff and, you know, and then they're not getting an education. There's also... Um, there's the reports from the surviving kids about all the years of them being abused. She's like, yeah, no, it wasn't just like the kids in the freezer. She's like, we all got our ass beat every day well, for all kinds of things, like burn marks, that, whippings, like shit like that. That to me is kind of like the, not smoking gun, but yeah. I mean, first off, if it is true, yeah, you know, if that did happen to the youngest, it's terrible. It's horrible. Yeah. And like she said, if she dealt with it when she was younger, that's something that's going to stick with you for your yeah. lifetime. Yeah. But killing children right. who might be committing these crimes is yeah. not the case. Right. I mean, in even in the eyes of the law, I think morally, it's just not the case. You don't. No. There's no death penalty for juveniles. Right. You know, that, that's not what happens. So. Yeah. Even if everything she says is true, it's still not justified. Yeah. Um, but I think the fact that kind of like what you're talking about with the surviving children. The fact that the the freezer in the living room basically acted as a reminder of why not to upset mom. Yeah. Kind of more points towards the fact that, yeah, they were afraid of her. They were not yeah. feeling like they were protected by yeah. her. She wasn't this almighty being for them. It was yeah. almost like, let's just graduate and get out of here, it yeah. sounds like, you know. After the um, two kids were taken out of the home, the surviving children, um, the oldest one... Um, now she's an, an adult, so now I feel okay yeah. like saying her name. I believe her name was Gabrielle and called her Gabby. And uh, she was interviewed later and she says that she remembers not only getting her ass beat too, but also like her mom forcing her to help put Stoney's body right. in yeah, the freezer. Yeah. That she was used yeah. to lift her up in right. the freezer. Right, and so that's, yeah. she's got that to live with, that she put her own sister in the freezer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. that's kind of where it's like, okay, well... If in her, in Michelle's eyes, if you're trying to protect your children that yeah. might be victims of this, yeah, you're also damaging them by, oh yeah, this is a separate form of abuse, like all, mental abuse, the right. fact that they now have to live yeah. knowing that this yeah. occurred. She did also kind of, a when um, Michelle was being interviewed, she took like some weird pride in the fact that her two surviving kids never saw her kill the other kid. She was like, no, 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 I, would, I wouldn't let them see that. She's like, no, but they were there for all the other scalding water. Mm -hmm. I saw in some reports that this is such a weird, another one of situations where some things are mentioned some places and some places aren't, but um, how she would get boiling Boil hot water, water. Yeah. and throw it on like their genitals. Like both of the kids, some were just saying that they made them stand in the hot showers. Um, but she was like, no, no, no. Like, don't worry. Like, they didn't see when the actual kids died. Like, I didn't let them see that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that just... Uh, Picking and choosing that what part of parenting. That plays to the fact that she's mentally unfit. Right. To be a mother, at least. Yeah, like it, right. The fact that they don't see it doesn't mean they don't know what's going on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Whether, you know, no matter what happened, she... I think just uh, maybe as much as she wanted to be a mom. Yeah. Just not meant to be a mother. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah so thank you for doing lot. the research on this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is a case that uh, is very... I'm sure there will be people coming forward like, well, you didn't mention yeah. this or that. Like, there's so much stuff, guys. Like, yeah. Exactly. Pick and choose what to put in here. I mean, it's all terrible. I mean, how much time do we have for this many terrible things to mention? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It, it's a weird one. Like you said, there it, there's people that are almost like on her side. Yeah. And or don't agree with what she did, but like, yeah, I get under, why she did under, it. But yeah. and I'm like, I don't it's really like that's not it either. But a thing that's not no. it's not. I I know why you killed your kids. That's never. Yeah. Uh, and I think th obviously they're trying to like. Well, I don't agree with it, but I get why she was like reacting to her own abuse when she was little, and she thought she was taking on them. Like I don't, I don't just don't. No, I don't know, dude. No. And you know what? I've got my own comments for those people, but I'm going to keep those to <laughs> yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. if you guys want to let us anyway. know what your comments are, feel mm -hmm. free. 
uh, follow us on Instagram. Let us know. Yeah. I will leave a question on Spotify and that I can pin your guys' answers. So yeah. anybody who clicks into the episode yeah. um, can see those. And I do have quite a bit of shout outs, but for the next one, this was oh, just yeah. such a long Oh, we've case. still got answers for the last bit of oh, banter yeah. that we had about <laughs> dishes the dish and washer. the dishwasher <laughs> procedures. So yeah. uh, we got some shout outs and we got some answers and it seems like everything's pretty uh, one-sided from what I've seen. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, those are, we're going to say for the next uh the ne- next long bit of banter mm-hmm. that we we do until then yeah i hope you guys enjoyed it yeah, again thanks. thank you for doing all the research on this so lots welcome. of sleepless nights yeah. for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyways uh that's been another episode hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, we'll talk to you guys in the next one yeah, see you next time. Adios. Bye.